Cadence Cadence video is going to go through a, a basic schematic and PCB flow inside of the Cadence PCB tools using AllCAD Capture and we're going to use AllCAD PCB Designer Standard with a little bit of professional as well. So I'm going to use all of the basic parts that are available inside the, the supplied libraries that come with the Cadence tools. Um, and in this example, I'm going to be using version 17.4. So what we're going to do is we're just going to draw a very, very simple, it's an amplifier uh, with a connector, a few uh, resistors uh, and a decoupling capacitor. So this is the schematic we're going to be drawing. And I'll just go through the basic process of how to go through this. So we'll start in AllCAD Capture. We're going to start off, um, this is the start page that starts when you start AllCAD Capture. Um, we're going to click on the new button and we're going to generate a, a design. So my design. Project wise, I'm going to keep the, the folder name the same so that everything gets stored in, in one specific location. You can enable piece by simulation if you're going to simulate this, but in this example, I'm not going to. So we'll click OK. The page file gets created, the project gets created. So you have now, I've got a default page here. So we'll start to place parts. So we'll use the place part command or the P button. There are different ways to do this. There's a place search providers, which I'll cover a little bit later on. There's a place database part. If you've got kind of a, a Windows compliant ODBC database that allows you to, uh, to place parts from a component database. Uh, not going to be covering that in this video, but if you look on, if you log into the, the Parsis EDA YouTube channel, um, there's lots of videos that cover this type of information. So we'll start with place parts. And in this example, you get a list of libraries. Let's just uh, we'll empty the library list for now. So when you first start this, you'll just see the design cache. So what happens is when you bring in a library and you place the part, that part gets copied to the design cache. Um, so you don't need to add libraries here. Everything can come from the place part functionality. So we can click on add library to add a part. This is the default location of where Cadence uh, provide the default some, some libraries. So uh, installation directory, so C Cadence 17.4 tools capture library is the directory. And you can see there's a list of uh, some OLB files here that contain all the schematic parts. So in this example, I want the amplifier library, I want the connector library, and I want the discrete library. So just control click to add those, click on open. They then get added here and you can see um, I then get a list of various parts um, that I can then go and use. So we'll start off for an amplifier. I'm just going to use a, a supplied part, so it's an LMC. And if I start typing up here, it then uses the filter to, to locate those items. So I've got a specific part here, a surface mount version LMC 6681. And we'll double click to add that part. The part is then attached to my mouse. I've got right mouse button functionality if I need to use it to do things like mirror horizontally or vertically. Um, and mode, etc. And then I'm just going to left click to place and I then get another one attached if I wanted to place two or three of these. So we'll just hit the escape key. <clears throat> we'll then go to the connector, tap in the part filter. So I want a, a header six. So I want a six way header. So that part's then attached to my mouse. Right mouse button, I want to mirror this uh, horizontally to flip the part round. And then we can then just go and drop this part down. Escape key to finish that. Discrete library. I want a capacitor, so C. So let's just zoom in with the I key, press the I key to zoom in. Um, we can then rotate this part. And then we can then just drop this down. Can actually use the R key to rotate rather than using the right click. So position the capacitor where I want it to go. Press the escape key again to finish this. And then finally, I want some resistors. So uh, we'll type R for a resistor. R to rotate the resistor down. And you can actually see I can drop this directly onto the pin. I'll get this little warning triangle and the blue dot, but I can drop these on the pins, which is what I want. And then what I can do is I can actually just drag these apart to make some, connect some connectivity here. So you can see I then get a connection that is auto named. So we'll just drag these apart. Let's just uh, drag the bar across here. We'll go and make the connection with uh, pin four. Let's just bring this down. Reposition that. So once I've finished uh, with the placing parts, we can just close the, the, the part functionality off. There is actually a bypass resistor um, that's also used in this circuit. I'm going to show that a little bit later on as part of our an ECO change that we do to this design. Um, so we'll leave that off for now. Um, let's play some power symbols. So 
but I want um, the VCC bar. Let's just drag this down, find the VCC bar. I want to call the net VCC, so click OK. We can attach that there. We can attach that there. Let's just rotate this round and drop it onto here. Double click to rename, so I'm going to call this minus five volts. And then we can just reposition that here. And then if we go and place the ground symbol, so I want one on my capacitor, one on the connector, and one on the uh, IC. I also need a five volts over on the connector. Let's just use Control C, Control V, copy paste, drop that down. W key to wire. Get that right. And that's my basic circuit. So um, I can name uh, aliases, I can change some values, do some PCB footprint properties, etc. But um, that's basic the, the basic process of the, of, of the circuit. So there is a, an option for things like place wire. I can use the W key. I just press the W key to wire, so it's quicker. Um, P to place parts, um, the power and ground. So these are shortcut keys that you can use to, to use the, the basic command inside of Walker. Okay. So let's change some, some values of here. So I, instead of it being a blank R, uh, I want this to be a, a certain resistor value. So I'm just going to double click the value here, just type the value that I want. So 10K resistors. Uh, I want a, just a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. Uh, everything else is kind of okay as it is. You can see that um, the online DRC inside of AllCAD Capture um, is actually telling me that I've got PCB footprint properties missing for all of my parts. So I need to ha add a PCB footprint name to these parts um, for it to then be able to, to produce a PCB from it. So what we can do here, um, we can just double click the parts. By default, when you double click the part, um, when you first start OK Capture, um, the properties are displayed in kind of a, a single row. I personally prefer if we, uh, you click the pivot button, so this little pivot button here, and it will show it show them in columns, which makes it a lot easier to see. Um, so we can click the part individually and then type in a manual PCB footprint. The other way to do this is just to draw a window around all the objects. Uh, and then just do a right click, edit properties. I then get to see all of my parts in one go. So I've got different options here. I've got schematic nets, flat nets, pins, title blocks, globals. Um, so we click click on the parts tab. I can then see all the parts and I can then start to look at PCB footprints. So the supplied PCB footprints are, are stored in one library. If we go to C cadence, SPB 17.4, share, PCB, PCB underscore lib, there's a symbols folder and there's lots and lots of PCB footprints in here um, that should cover um, quite a good variety of parts. There's also um, resources on the web on the on the web. So if you go to um, companies such as Symexis, Snap EDA, Ultra Librarian, these will provide schematic symbols, PCB footprints and uh, 3D step models. You can also go to 3D Content Central. Um, these provide step models. Um, they're all for free, so um, you can have subscription services with some of these companies if you prefer. But a lot of these are just free resources where you can actually just log in, create an account, and then uh, download PCB footprints. They come with download instructions and stuff, and I'll show you a little bit of an example of this later on in the in the demo. So lots and lots of different file names here for PCB footprints. You can scroll the list. There is actually a, uh, a resource for this. So if we go to a parallel hyphen systems.co.uk website, there's a guides link along the top. 
Um, and if we scroll this down, these are PDF user guides for, for AllCAD Capture, for Capture CIS, AllCAD PCBice, and PCB Editor. And if we scroll down to the bottom, there's one here. This is a PCB footprint supplied by with the Cadence PCB Editor. It is a large file, it's 22 megabytes. Um, I've got it downloaded here already. And this basically gives you kind of a, a graphical representation of what all the parts mean, what they are. And you just need the name. You don't need any file extension at all with this. So R1, R2, and R3. Um, U1 is just an SOIC. So I'm just going to type that in because I know what it is. And I know that's obviously got one of those available in the library. Um, so the final thing is the, is the connector. So I've now got PCB footprints for all my parts. So we can then close the property editor. So I now get a new DRC here. So it says warning number of pins in the footprint SOIC 8 and instance U1 does not match. OK, so what does that mean? So let's select the part. We can do a right click show footprint. This will show me that I've got a, an 8 pin SOIC. So pins 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If I look at my schematic symbol, I'm only physically showing pins 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So I'm missing pins 1 and pin 8. So with the case PCB tools, um, the pin numbers must match. It must have an equal number in both. So in this example, I've only got effectively six pins. And what I need is I need eight pins. So I could um, draw my schematic symbol with all eight pins and just have two NC pins showing as not connectors. Um, that's fine on, on something as small as this. So you can go and edit the part manually yourself. Um, a slightly quicker way is to just do it as a property. So we can double click this part. We can add a new property to this part. The property name is called NC for non-connected pins. And then it, the, the value is basically a comma separated list. So in this example, I've got two pins, one and eight. So one comma eight. If I had, you know, 15 pins, it could be one comma eight comma 10, 20, 30, whatever you've got. But it's a comma separated list to, to do this. So we'll click OK. Uh, and you'll notice straight away that the DRC disappears and we're kind of good to go. And um, so the only thing I need to do now is maybe name some some net or some wire. So. In most instances, um, you'll see that the, the tools actually auto name. So there's an N00213, an N00209. So it gives it an auto name of an N00. Um, for nets that you're concerned about, I would always recommend naming a net. So at least it's easier to find when you're trying to apply a rule to it or root it. Um, so I've got an N plus. So I'm going to call that N plus. And that's going to be the bottom one. So let's put the one over here. Control E for edit to bring up the alias again. I can then put an in minus. And then we'll do a control E again. And I want out as the output. So name any nets that you're interested in. Things like the, the power nets, because they've got these power symbols, will uh, use that name there. So you can see that these names are being used here. Um, that's I'm happy with this design. So we'll just save that. And then we're ready to start um, the PCP. So the way we would do that um, we, is we use the PCB menu. There's a new layout button um, and there's a design sync setup uh, option. So we click on the design sync setup. This kind of says these are the default settings for how the PCB folder is going to be generated. I've got a, an Allegro folder. That's where the board file will be. So that's going to be in my project directory. Um, um, these are mainly for ECOs. So, um, but these are the default settings. So they're good for me to go. So we'll use PCB new layout. Uh, I haven't got an input board, so this is my Allegro directory. It's going to get created. I haven't got an input board, but if you had a start board or a template board, or you're doing an ECO, for example, you can effectively have that as an input board. This is the board it's going to produce. So I'm going to click OK. My netlist files get generated. Um, I get a license picker. You may or may not, depending on the license levels that you have, but I'm going to start with an AllCAD standard license. We'll click OK. Um, PC Editor launches, and I'm kind of I'm ready to start working. You can see I've got a list of parts here. These are the parts that need to be placed, and they then will come onto the screen. They're going to have it to be this placement bin. Um, but let's start off with some basic settings. So, setup, design parameters. So if I look at um, the display tab, this has got some default sizes for objects. Um, I want to show things like plated holes, non-plated holes. You could do all this and then store it as a, as a template board, for example, if you wanted to do that type of thing. Um, we can look at the grids. So there's a setup grids option. Um, before we do that, let's uh, let's go and set the units. So we'll go to the design tab. 
Um, I want to set the, the units I want to work in. So in this example, I'm going to work in millimeters. And uh, maybe the paper size, so the size of the area that I'm going to work on, just an A4 piece of paper will be big enough for me. That gives me my design boundary. So it sets effectively um, 0, 0 as the lower left and right, and then the size of an A4 piece of paper. Um, you might want to adjust effectively where the bottom of the screen is. So 0, 0, instead of it being in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, would be 50 millimeters in. So it gives me a little bit of room to work around. I can have 0, 0 as the bottom left-hand corner of my PCB. We go back to the display tab. Let's click on the setup grids now. Um, and we can set this as, sorry, let's just hit apply first for the units. Then we go to the setup grids. We can then set some units here. So 0.5, I can use the tab key to just cycle through the values here. 0.1 for my routing grids, 0.5 for my placement grid. That should be plenty. So I'll hit apply and OK. Um, there are some other settings here, but they're the kind of the defaults that we need to worry about for now. So we'll click OK. You can then see there's this kind of zero, zero origin location comes up on the screen. We probably want to start with drawing a board out or a design out. So there's a few ways to do this. I can do an import MCAD, DXF, IDF or IDX if I've got an outline or the information coming from my MCAD team. Um, so if they're designing an outline and it's a, bit, a, a complex profile, you can use DXF, IDF or IDX. Um, you can also use this to place components. You can use this kind of functionality to bring in mounting holes, etc. It's a, there's videos on again on Parsis EDA that will go through this kind of flow for you. In this example, we're just going to draw a basic rectangle. So I'm going to use the shape command rectangular. The options pane here, these are docked windows. Um, this will change depending on the command that you're in. So I'm effectively going to pick the class, the layer that I want to draw these on. So I've got effectively board geometry, different classes, board geometry, package geometry, manufacturing, etc. So I want the board geometry as the class because it's a board based item. Its design outline is the one I want to use. Um, it's an unfilled shape. I could say place rectangle and then that rectangle of this specific size would be available to me. I can put in things like rounded corners, which is zoom in a bit so you can see that if I wanted to do this type of thing. Uh, I'm just going to draw a rectangle. Um, so I'm going to start at the zero zero location, and the way I would do that is effectively just type X at the command line, lowercase X, and then it's zero space zero for the for the X and Y coordinate. Hit return, and then that gives me my starting point. Um, you can drag it using the grid settings that you've got to to get to the location that you want, or you can just type in effectively um, the size of the board that you want. And I know that the board is going to be X is uh, 26 millimeters long. 21 millimeters high. So I'll just click on that and I get a rectangular of that specific size. I've actually got the rounded corner, so let me just uh, delete that and do that again. So let's do add the shape. Uh, I want orthogonal base corners, so x is space zero, and then we'll do 26 by 21. So I now have my board outline. What we can do is actually add um, areas uh, within this um, to stop me doing things like putting roots across the edge of the board or placing components too close to the edge of the board. Um, so we can manually draw these. These are areas are called root keeping and package keeping, or we can use the profile that we have here. I mean, in this example, it's a rectangle, so it's quite straightforward. But if you imagine you've got a complex profile, um, you don't want to have to redraw something offset by a set amount. So there's actually a command we can use the shape Z copy command to, to effectively offset, expand or contract the profile that we have um, to redraw the area. So the class or subclass, we want to go from <clears throat> the board geometry outline to the package keeping. I want to contract the board outline by half a millimeter. I can then click on the outline and I get my profile for the package keeping. I want the same for root keeping. So we'll just click on the outline again. So there's my two areas that I can then use. So I'm now ready to start trying to place my components. So there are different modes inside of PCB Editor. There's a general edit mode. Let's just click down here. There's a few ways to get this. You, you've obviously got the icons along the top here. You can right mouse button application mode and see the different modes you've got. So there's a general, a placement, an etch, a signal integrity, and a shape edit mode. Um, depending on kind of the application or what the commands you're trying to do, you can obviously the mode that, that makes most sense to you. You don't have to use the modes. You can uh, you can invoke a command. You can use the icon. So lots of different ways to drive the tools here. 
We'll start off obviously, so in placement edit mode, I can then click and place components. I get this placement bin in my options pane. So if I select the, 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 the connector, it's attached to my mouse. Um, I can use right mouse bar functionality to maybe uh, rotate this round. So rotate it around different locations or orientations, place the connector down. If I bring the IC in, um, right mouse bar mirror, we'll flip it to the back side of the PCB. Um, so if I wanted to place this on the bottom of the port of the board, I could do that. Let's just move this back because I don't need this example. Um, so we then go and place the IC down where we want. Um, so I can place it using this placement bin option here. I can use place components manually. I then get a, a different kind of um, window, a placement window here. So I can then come in and bring the parts here. Um, let's just cancel that. If I hide this window, what I can do though, is effectively if I have the schematic and the PCB open side by side, I can effectively select the part in the schematic and then it becomes attached to my part in the PCB or to my mouse in the PCB. So I can also use this to place components, which can be quite a useful method um, because you, you can be a bit more intelligent based on, on how you want to place the parts. So once that's finished, obviously, um, let's just uh, complete that command. If we go back, actually, let's have the schematic and the PCB open side by side. I can then use this to do cross probing. So I can select parts, I can select nets. Um, and adjust, highlight my design, do checks on my design, where the nets are going to be, where the parts are going to be. So they're fully interacted between these two tools. We can obviously, they're always talking to one another. So um, let's go back and make that ECO change. I want to go and add that, that bypass resistor that I forgot. So I'm just going to just save my board here quickly. I'm not going to close PCB editor down. I don't need to do that. And um, we'll open the schematic tools. I want to add the new resistor, so I'm literally just going to come here and do a control, uh, control C, control V to copy and paste. We put R4 down, the wire command to wire R4. Bring R4 down. And then what we'll run is we'll run um, the PCB command update layout. The design sync process will run and you'll see a list of the changes. So it's only going to add R4 and it's going to add the two connections to it. I'm happy with that. So I then, once I'm happy with that, I can then press the sync button. The synchronization is done and I'm now back in my PCB, ready to go and place R4 wherever I need to go and place it. So quite a useful process to be able to do that. Um, you can then go and work out um, from a design point of view, you haven't got to close tools down, regenerate netlist and, and hope that it's right, you can actually see the synchronization function. Um, and that also works going back if you were to make a change, maybe rename a connector or rename a, an IC or do a pin swap. Those type of functionalities, you would use the, the PCB update schematic. You would see a list of what the changes are going to be, and then you could then bring that directly in using the sync command. So let's just finish our placement off. Um, let's maybe rotate this resistor. What I will do actually is just go, um, if you look at the move command, so edit move. There is some dynamic alignment. So if you've got a bigger board and you want to start aligning components, you can actually have that. That's why those purple lines are when you're bringing parts in. I don't want the dynamic alignment enabled, so I'm just going to turn that off here. Um, and if we're back in placement edit mode, I can then just go and place the parts where I want them to be. Maybe let's just bring that over a little bit. Right mouse button rotate. Let's bring the decoupler in. So let's just bring in R1 and R2. Now you can see if I place these two close to one another, I'm going to get this little DRC because um, I've got a, effectively an overlap between the, the two resistors, the boundary. Every component has something called a place bound top. Um, which is the boundary of the component. Um, some people draw these size for size, some people draw these slightly bigger. Um, it's quite a useful function to, to give you space between components when you're placing so you, you don't get um, shadowing and stuff when you've got the auto place um, using machinery, um, SMD machines to place the components. So I'm just going to spread these parts apart a little bit just to give me a bit of space. Yeah, that looks good. I'm, I'm kind of happy with my placement. Um, so we'll then save my board. So the next thing I want to do is I'm just going to look at um, 
the colors, some of the default colors that I have for the design here. There's a couple of ways to access this. We can use the, the setup colors command, control plus F5. I've got this little colored circle, uh, which is the corresponding icon here. If I click on that, I then uh, see the color dialog. So I've got different areas. I've got stack up areas, geometry components. These hold the different classes, the subclasses. So the stack up would be basically effectively the, the copper layers, any mask related to the to the copper, the, the pins, etc., like that. We can change the colors here and it's literally, you pick the color that you want um, and you can come along with just kind of the objects that you want here. Or you can, if you want them all to be the same, you click on the all swatch and it would do them more than one go. So I want uh, blue for the top, red for the bottom, I want yellow for my DRCs. Let's go to the geometry folder. Maybe I want uh, the design outline to be yellow. Um, I probably want silk screen, so maybe let's set silk screen top to be green. I've got a components folder. This is all the text-based objects, so you can see there's quite a lot of text here um, with device names and, and silk screen names, etc. So let's just turn all the text-based objects off, and then we'll turn on the silk screen top and set it to green as well. That's probably okay. That's all I need to worry about for now. So we'll click OK to that, and that's my colors set. So we're almost ready to route, but what we probably want to do now is, is set some rules for uh, for the nets that we've got here. We can just invoke, you know, the add connect command and manually adjust line widths and just start routing. On a board this size, that's probably fine, but it's good practice to actually go and set rules. Um, these are some of the default rules. This is the default line thickness that comes with the default tracking gap. Maybe that's a, that's a, it's okay, you know, it's a 5,000 tracking gap, that's probably fine, but um, on a board this, maybe you want to, um, put some slightly thicker tracks down, have some better spacing, etc. Always useful to talk to the PCB fabricator as well and just find out what their what their costs are for, for different tracking gaps. You, if you route it slightly with a bigger tracking gap, you might actually get the board cheaper. So it's something to consider. If we go to setup and constraints, this is where all the rule sets are inside of the Kane's PCB tools. So we've got some different workbooks available to us. There's an electrical workbook, there's a physical workbook, spacing, same net spacing manufacturing and properties. Again, the YouTube channel Parsis EDA um, has lots and lots of videos um, that cover a lot of these kind of features and functions. We'll go through some of the basics today. Um, so in this example, physical, I've got effectively a net or layers where I've got a list of all the nets available to my design. So there's the net name. They're using a default rule, um, and this is the default rule values that it's got. We go to the constraint set or layers, this is the default. This, so this is the default rule. This is the thickness that it uses. So for example, let's just say, let's come in here and say I want to make the default rule um, 0.3 of a millimeter. This will be the default rule thickness. So I've made one change and effectively all of those roots now, all those nets are using that 0.3. So rather than coming in and, and maybe making a change here and saying, yeah, this could be 0.7, that's fine. Um, I'm making an override to, to the rule here. And what I really want to be doing is, is creating creating rules and applying rules. On a, on a board that's kind of this, it's, what is it, it's, it's less than 10 nets. Um, it's probably not too much bother, but if you've got a design with 1,000 nets or 4,000 nets or 10,000 nets, you wanna try and put some structure and some organization in here, so it's good practice. So let's just right mouse button and clear that, and we're going to create some rules. So I've got a default rule here. Um, I'm gonna create um, a physical C set. Let's create a power rule for my power nets. Maybe set the value to, uh, 0.6. Uh, I'm going to create a differential pair rule. So right mouse button create physical C set again. Call this diff. So the diff I want the track thickness to be 0.25. So that uses the midline width. The primary gap, so the gap I need is going to be 0.25 as well. I'm going to set a tolerance here, which can be useful um, when you're routing off angle. Um, or odd angled nets, and it's just good general good practice for a differential pair to effectively specify a tolerance value. And then you can specify this midline spacing value, which will be the primary gap or the next gap if you set both, um, whichever is the smallest minus the tolerance. So in this example, 0.25 minus 0.05, so I can actually set 0.2 to the midline spacing. So in this example, obviously we get the little uh, arrows here, you can set these, uh, this would be, if you're setting at the top level, it's going to set um, the same value for all the different layers. You can have different layers per, um, or different values per layer if you if that's what you prefer, okay? 
So effectively, there's my, my three physical rules. I then go to my net. So I want to apply some of these. So um, again, I can just hit the drop down and do power and do power and do it individually. Or what I can do here um, is actually make some classes to group the net. So I, I want to make a power class. Um, this can be done in the schematic or the PCB, but I'm just going to do it in the PCB here. So I'm just going to control click the three power nets, right mouse button, create something called a class. Let's call it power. And then we'll specify our power rule to those nets. I'm going to select these two nets, right mouse button, create a differential pair. Let's give the differential pair a name. So let's call it DP underscore. Need to click on create. And click on the create to generate the differential pair. We'll close and then we'll apply our differential pair rule um, to that those two nets. OK, um, let's look at some spacing rules. So again, same scenario. I've got um, all my, my rules here. My, my classes and my differential pair rules now apply through the different areas that I've got. Um, these are currently all using a 0.127 rule, which is, again, is quite a tight uh, 5,000 space between all your objects. And if we double click here, we can expand these out to look at all the different types. If you don't want to set different values for all these type of things, we can literally just drag select all the values here and then type the value that we want. So I want a 0.2 of millimeter. That would be um, the spacing that I'm going to use for my, uh, for my routing. You can do things like class to class, where if you create classes, you can set rules between classes to classes. Again, there's videos that are going to show you how to do that. The final rule I'm going to set is um, if I go to my differential pair worksheet, my, my differential pair here, I'm just going to um, ignore the gather control, maybe set a max uncoupled length of a millimeter, and follow to 0.5. So you will notice that some of the column headings here are yellow. This means that the DRC mode is not enabled. So the tools won't be checking for this. So we need to make sure they're turned on. Um, I can either just right mouse button on the yellow column and just hit analysis mode and that will turn the, the DRC check on. But a safer way or a better way is to look at analyze analysis modes because this gives you the ability to look at all the different rule sets and what rules are turned on or off um, for your board. So things like physical and spacing are all turned on by default. Um, but if you look at the design, you'll see that some of these are enabled, some of them aren't. So if you look at things like um, Solder mask ones, the solder mask checks aren't enabled. So if you wanted to check for solder mask, you could do that. There's some general base rules for looking at things like duplicate drill hole. Again, a useful thing to enable. So you could kind of just come along and just enable that. So electrical um, will turn on all the differential pair checks. And there is like a little uh, information bar here that will give you defaults on, on the DRC modes, what each one does. Um, so you can physically see what the, what the rule does. Um, again, quite useful. There's some for things like fabrication, mask test, uh, annular ring checks, etc. And again, you can actually see graphical representations of what these rule sets are, um, which again can give you information on, on your rule sets and, and whether you need to apply these rules or not. We'll click apply and OK, um, and you'll notice the yellow columns have gone, so we are then ready to start routing the design. We can close Constraint Manager <coughs> and we go to our board. So. To route, um, there's a couple of options. We can go to route, connect. We can hit the F3 key to invoke the command. We can use this little icon, um, this one here, corresponding icon to invoke the route command. So we click on that, you'll see that the options pane changes. You've got things like an active and alternative layer. So if you're um, adding wires, it would swap between the active and alternative layers. You can hit the drop down arrow here. I can also get this from a right click. So if I do a right click here, I've got change active and change alternative layer as I'm going along. Um, so if you've got more than one here or more than more than just a double sided board, um, you'll see the different layers that you've got available to you. If you are using a multi layer board, though, I rec would recommend going from the alternative mode effectively to the working layer mode, which allows you to enable the layers that you want to change to. And then you get a pop up by your mouse when you add a via, um, which makes it a lot quicker and a lot less, less mouse travel. There's other options for routing, obviously, whether it's lines or arcs, whether they're 45s, 90s or off. So free angle, um, shove preferred, shove and hug for how the routes behave to one another. And there's some other settings as well. It's worthwhile having a play when, you, when you're actually routing your board. The other way to do this is, um, let's just end that command, is if we invoke the edge edit mode. 
what this means is when I make a single click, um, I'm then automatically routing. So if I click on a pin, click on a via, click on a connect line um, or a rat's nest, I'm going to be in route mode. And you'll notice when I click on the, the pin here, it starts to route. The line width is, is driven by constraint merger. So obviously this is a power track, so it's going to route at 0 0.6. This is the just an output, uh, a default track. That's 0 0.3. There's the differential pair jumping together at 0.25. So um, you can just do this on the fly, but I think it's quicker to set up constraint manager and it gives you the ability to do DRC. So let's just go and route our boards. If we're going to change layer, what we'll do is we'll actually come up here, um, let's drop a via. So right mouse button, add via, we'll add a via, but the easier way to do it is simply just double click your mouse. And you can see I can add vias as I go along. Right mouse button, oops, just undoes that. Got too many vias here. I can hover over the segment, right mouse button, change to layer. Let's change that to the bottom, and that gets rid of the vias as well as swaps the segment. So let's just read the differential pair, <coughs> and they jump together based on the rule sets that we have in Constraint Manager. So I'm getting a DRC error here. Let's just hover over and see if we can get the tooltip. So that's the pin. So let's hit the tab key on the keyboard so I get a net. I get the vertical line segment, connect line. Let's just scroll in a little bit here to see what's going on. There's my differential pair error. So the constraint value is half a millimeter. That's our phase tolerance. Um, the actual value is 0.6285. So we're out by about 0.1285, um, where one net is longer than the other. So it's not meeting that half a millimeter tolerance. If we hit the tab key to get the net, you can see effectively 20.426 and 19.79. So we're not meeting our constraint. I might be able to kind of shorten these uh, these 45 degrees by using the slide command um, to take out some of that mismatch, but it's unlikely I'm going to be able to do that um, because of you know just the nature of the way that this track on here is, is obviously shorter than this track here. So we're probably better off adding a phase bump. We can do this manually by using the add connect command and just routing a little bump in here, or we can, uh, in this example, I'm going to go to a professional base license, and then I'll use the command root and phase tune. I could use the root delay tune command and add delay tune, but the phase tune bumps built for this type of functionality just to add a little phase bump on a specific size, and it can be a line or an arc. I can then just pick the track that I want, and it adds this little uh, phase bump here automatically for me. Um, uh, I'm now added that intra length, so I'm meeting my constraint. If we look at constraint manager, and we just analyze our differential pair, you can see that everything's green, so we're meeting our constraint. <clears throat> so let's add some copper shapes just to finish this board off. So we'll go to um, the shape Z copy. I'm just going to use the board profile to make a copper shape for the bottom of the board. So edge bottom, create a dynamic shape, half a millimeter smaller than the board. Left click on the board. Hover over this shape, you can see that it's an auto-generated shape. It's etch on the bottom. And it's a dummy net, so there's no net name assigned to this yet. So we can use the, the shape, select shape or isolation cavity command. It's this little arrow with the icon here. Let's click on that. Left click the shape, um, and then I can uh, right mouse button assign net. And I'm just going to pick the pin here. Let's do that again. Shape, select shape or void. Uh, sign net, pick the pin, um, <clears throat> and that then assigns this shape to ground plane or to VCC. Sorry. So once I've done that, obviously this track here is now um, in, in consumed in the shape, so I don't need this anymore. So I could just go and delete that um, because this pin is already connected using the the plane. I don't need any of this, so we can uh, let's just do a right mouse button delete that. Don't need the via, so we can delete that via, and we could uh, let's just slide this via down here like that. Um, let's add another shape to the for the ground. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to delete, um, let's just turn off shapes, delete um, the two tracks here. 
let's use the uh, the root to create fan out command. Um, I want to go maybe east on uh, this pin. So that gives me a vibe for my ground pin. That's fine. Let's add a shape. So I'm just going to draw a uh, a polygon based shape on the bottom. We'll hit the browse button here and use ground as the net name. And I'm just going to draw a shape in here. I think it my ground shape here. I do need to make that connection there on the top of the board. So we'll make that in. So that's me complete. Um, a couple of good checks for this. So if we go to check and design status, I've got um, this traffic light system based on, on nets and connections and stuff. These are uh, reportable. So you can actually click on the colored swatch here and it will actually give you a report to show you what's going on. I've got uh, my DRCs aren't up to date, so let's just run that. That's up to date. So we're now meeting our design. We're kind of all good to go. Um, maybe let's just save the board. Have a look at the um, the board in a 3D canvas, which we can use the uh, the icon here, 3D icon, or there's a display 3D canvas menu command. We'll click OK, and we're going to see a, a 3D representation of our board. So it doesn't look like we have any step models associated to our PCB footprints. So you can actually um, map this in the library, map it to the PCB footprint itself. Um, I'll show you how to do this in the board file, but um, you would normally do this in the library. So um, there is a 3D mapper tab inside, um, and you'll see a list of effectively the footprints that you have. Um, so I'm going to click on the SOIC 8 here. Uh, let's just click on device only, so it will just show me the device. I then want to go and browse for a PCB footprint. So I've got a library of step models here. Um, you can get step models from places like Ultra Librarian, Symexis, Snap EDA, or 3D Content Central. Um, they're good places to get step models. A lot of component manufacturers will provide step models as well. So um, you need to find a step file that matches. So I've got a, a net looking for an SOIC8. So I'll click open. That then brings effectively the, the step model in. You can see that sometimes the XYZs don't aut automatically match. So use the... Um, and the buttons at the bottom here. There is a full video going through this, um, but I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. So click on the auto button, and that would then align my, my IC in the correct orientation. So SMC will browse 0805 um, auto button. And again, the auto button is working for a lot of common parts. So you'll see in this scenario, or in all of these scenarios, actually, it's a it's going to work for me, so we'll browse again for the 0805. We'll click the auto button, and if I go back to the full board, that's done all of my parts there. For the connector, let's just see what we've got. So let's browse. Have we got a header? Uh, one by six. Doesn't look like I've got a specific header um, that matches this part. So um, Let's look at another option for the header. So because I do actually want to change the header. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll close this. We'll save our board. Um, so let's go back to the schematic. <coughs> so in this scenario, um, a lot of these parts are just the basic parts that Cadence have provided. We can actually use other functions to, to place parts and get more information. So let's, uh, let's look at the, the place search providers command. What this does is give us direct access to Symexis and to Ultra Librarian. Um, you need to log in for these, so there'll be a login function. Um, I've already logged in here. When you first start this, if you haven't done it before, there's a login page. Um, free lo the, the first one is the cadence login that you'll need um, to when you're accessing things like the software and uh, getting hot fixes, etc. Using the support web page for resources. Um, that's part of the login. Uh, the Ultra Library, you'd have to go to Ultra Library and create an account, but it's a free registration. So you can then look through, um, do keyword searches here for what parts you want to go and find. So if I wanted to find a connector here, um, let's see if I can find a, a reasonable connector that we've got here. You'll see if they've got effectively um, the data sheet, the schematic symbol, the footprint, and the 3D step model, 
um, you've got a good chance of kind of getting to the connector that you want. This is showing me that I've got all the available parts. I've got effectively a schematic symbol. I've got a PCB footprint. That all looks good. Um, so what I can do here is click on the plus button and that would then go and uh, download these parts directly from Ultra Librarian for me. That then becomes attached to my mouse and I can then go and place the connector down. So the advantage of using this part is if I double click and look at this part, obviously it gives me the PCB footprint, the schematic symbol and the 3D step model. It's also given me all this property information, which can be really useful when I'm generating a bill of materials. I've got things like um, a manufacturing part number. I've got the manufacturer. I've got the distributor. I've got the distributor part number. So this can all be output in a bit of materials or a report file. Um, and I haven't manually got to enter any of this data, um, which can save me a lot of time. So let's just, uh, if we compare obviously that to the, these two parts, let's just do an edit properties. You can see the basic connector part um, has very little uh, information. It's basically got a PCB footprint and a value, um, whereas I get all this other information with the part that I downloaded from Ultra Librarian. So it's worthwhile having a look at this. It's a free resource. There is a paid for version that will give you more functionality, um, but from a free point of view, this is quite a, quite a useful function. So let's just uh, we'll delete that connector. We'll just slot that one in there. Let's just call this J1. And I'm going to just unset um, the user assigned reference designator because uh, I'm just going to use this as J1. So we'll then run the PCB um, update layout command. You can see it's removed J1 and then it's added J, the new J1 with the new connections. We'll click on sync. And if we go to PCB editor. Now, my connector is a slightly different pitch and it has created some DRCs for me to go and correct. But you understand the principle of, of being able to use this functionality in this part. Uh, going forward. Um, so that kind of concludes this video. Um, I hope it gives you a good overview of, of, of the Cadence PCB tools and the flow, the way Design Sync works, the way some of the 3D works, the way uh, the place search providers works. There are lots of videos. If you go to um, the Power of Systems homepage, let's go to uh, the matrix. So there's a matrix link here along the top. These are all YouTube videos for kind of all okay, capture and then PCB editor covering pretty much most of the features for all the different levels. So you've got AllCAD standard, AllCAD professional and Allegro PCB designer and then some of the Allegro options. So it's worthwhile having a look at some of these videos.